This presentation will be by Christopher Sasher with Infrastructures Engineering and Greg Richards with KTA uh, Tater. Uh, Christopher, he has a lot of experience in bridge inspection and transportation design. He's a SPRAT certified level three rope access supervisor, which the way that he defined it kind of on uh, the paper here is that uh, he basically gets to climb on the world's largest jungle gyms. Uh, Greg Richards is the area manager of the Southern Territory for KTA. Uh, he has over 40 years of experience dealing with coding related issues. Um, and this particular project is of interest because not only did it have uh, uh, some coding issues associated with it, it also had access issues. And I believe they'll, uh, they'll discuss that during the presentation. Uh, we wanted to go over a recent project, um, doing field metalizing of the uh, Perdido Key Bridge. Uh, first off, uh, I'm just going to go through, give you some background on the project, um, tell you what we were trying to achieve, and then have Greg uh, tell you how we get, actually achieved it. The Perdido Key Bridge is located in the western panhandle of Florida, uh, right next to Pensacola, Florida. Uh, it's actually one of the only it's the only bridge that connects uh, Pensacola with Perdido Key. Uh, the other bridge is up in the far west end of the, uh, of the key. It's actually a 74 mile detour uh, to close this bridge. The island is uh, pretty populated. Uh, we've got a lot of park area, a lot of beach access, a lot of hotels. It's pretty built up. There's a lot of traffic, about 18,000 vehicles per day travel this bridge. Um, it's in pretty good condition. Uh, overall, the, uh, there, it carries two lanes of traffic uh, with five foot wide shoulders. Um, it's made up of uh, you know, three main spans or uh, continuous sp spans of four steel plate girders. The approach spans are just uh, pre-stressed concrete girders. Um, and you can see, oops, you can see here on this slide, the actual uh, width of the bridge is the biggest restriction. For so much traffic, um, sharing just two lanes and the five foot wide shoulders, uh, pedestrian traffic and bicyclists uh, can get pretty, pretty hairy going through there. And any disruption to the flow of traffic uh, causes a major uproar with the public. We chose field metalizing for um, several, several reasons. The future capacity demands I already covered. Uh, you know, the growth of the area is, is kind of stable. We're not expecting this bridge to be demolished and replaced with a wider bridge in the next 40 years. Um, the existing structure is in good condition, including the deck and the uh, structural steel that will be uh, coated. It's just the existing coating is in poor condition and it's reached the end of its service life. Um, the bridge is in a, a harsh coastal environment. Uh, it's constantly exposed to chlorides. Um, the uh, the maintenance costs for this bridge are uh, pretty high due to the uh, impact on the public, both in direct costs and indirect costs uh, associated with the uh, the MOT, you know, with the lane closures. Um, so that was a, a major con design consideration that we were having to uh, tackle. Uh, the scope of work metalized the uh, main spans, um, and we we're going to paint the uh, bearings at all the piers with just a typical polymeric coating. Uh, we removed, uh, cleaned, and coated um, the intermediate cross frames. This uh, made sure that we got rid of all the pack rust, got into all the nooks and crannies, made it a lot easier to ensure we're going to achieve the service life of the product. The lower lateral bracing we actually removed completely from this bridge, um, did not reinstall. This made it a lot easier to get the, uh, the proper coating. We also specified to the contractor that they were not allowed to use the deck pretty much for the entire job. Uh, all the work had to be done from underneath so that the traveling public really never knew what was going on. So all work was done from the channel uh, they were to maintain the existing uh, vertical clearances for marine traffic. Uh, the barge, everything was going to be done from a, a barge with a man lift and that had to be uh, able to be moved to allow marine traffic through. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chris. All this was done, the design was a consideration when FDOT had to deal with the public pressure for the uh, maintenance of traffic and to keep the bridge open to the traveling public. Uh, we came up with some ideas and did some modifications to the existing uh, FDOT specifications, section 560 and 561. And that included the removal of pack rust, 
We also increased the level of surface preparation to SSPC5 and ACE1 white metal blast cleaning for the metallizing. And we asked for an anchor profile of three to five and a half mil, mils. And we were very clear that that anchor profile had to be uh, angular and dense so that the metallizing would mechanically adhere itself to it. And then we did some heat uh, and we did testing at five tests per 100 square feet for the uh, anchor profile. Uh, we asked for the wire, the metallizing wire, to be 85% zinc and 15 aluminum. And we required multiple passes of the, wire, of the gun to achieve 8 to 12 mils. And we also applied a coat of 100% epoxy penetrating sealer to seal the porosity of the metallizing. Applied caulking to all the fading surfaces. You'll actually see a picture of the caulking here in a little bit. And then uh, we top coated with aliphatic urethane for the blue color. And then we applied a clear coat to all the surfaces. And normally with FDOT, we applied the clear coat to only the outside faces sometimes, but uh, we did the clear coat on everything here because of the longevity of the project we were trying to get. This was some of the equipment that we used, but the basic uh, premise here was we had to have the 8515 wire per ASTM B833. And we also acquired the, uh, required the electric arc equipment manufacturer on site to verify the suitability of the equipment for the application and to make sure that the applicators were able to use it correctly to produce a specified product. Contractor qualifications, we asked that the contractor have three years of metallizing experience and documentation of thermal spray projects they'd done over the last three years. The superintendent, we wanted to have three years of certified verifiable experience where you participate in this type of project. And the applicators, one year of certified verifiable experience. And they had to perform adhesion tests and bend tests per a uh, standard NACE 12, AWS C2.23, and SSPC CS23. Uh, these were actually the bend tests that the, the applicators had to qualify to. Nine bin tests, they had to have three at three, at three different positions, vertical, horizontal, and overhead. And they were uh, asked to put them on at about eight to 10 mils. And then they were bent across this uh, mandrel, half inch mandrel, and they were checked for cracking. And you can see the last one up there, it's not very clear, but you can see the cracking at the top of it where the metallizing is split. They also had to do adhesion testing uh, prior to being able to apply the metallizing to the bridge. And they did a six by six plate in uh, three pull tests, and those pull tests had to achieve an average of 750 psi minimum. The picture here is actually a job site reference we used, and we applied this to see what the blast should look like. We all agreed on the SP5 and clear coated it, and then we used this to do some pull tests, and we also used this plate to verify the type of texture we were looking for from the metallizing. Uh, for Quality assurance and quality control. Uh, each the contractor was required to have a QC specialist. The QC specialist was responsible for the total application and testing of the metallizing. He wrote the procedure, wrote the contractor's work plan, and he also had to be on site for 50% of the testing of, e of the elements. Uh, we asked that he have two years metallizing experience and five years in corrosion control coatings on stru steel structures. The contractor had to have a QC supervisor. The supervisor had to be NACE 3 or SSPC BCI level 2, but was not required to be on site all the time. Uh, two years metallizing experience in the same five years in con corrosion control. The actual on site QC inspectors needed to be NACE 1 or SSPC BCI 1, but they had to report directly to the uh, QC supervisor. We established some whole points, the same type of stuff that Paul talked about in his presentation. The first one, and this kind of goes for every project you'd ever do concerning metallizing or coatings or those things, is ambient conditions. They kind of follow us around. Uh, except for the metallizing, there's no humidity requirement, so we could drop that one. Uh, we did pressure wash the entire structure before surface preparation, and then we do some pre-cleaning to the wells to remove spatter and sharp edges. And the other thing that the FDOT spec allowed us to do was to make sure that the flame cut edges or the hardened edges were properly prepared before blasting so we could achieve the proper surface profile. Uh, we also did SSPC SP1 solvent cleaning. And then uh, the surface preparation, as I said before, was SP5 for the metallizing. And then for the bearings, we went back to the typical uh, FDOT spec that we use, SP10 near white blast cleaning. 
and we check for soluble salts after final surface preparation. And one of the things because of our environment in Florida that they've written into the spec too that contractors bid is checking for soluble salts in between coats. Uh, some reasons for that uh, just because of the area we're in. Uh, for the metallizing application, we checked dry film thickness and required 8 to 12 mils. Uh, we checked for texture and then we did adhesion testing as you can see in the picture here. Sealer application, there's really no DFT check for the type of sealer we used. It's only supposed to be a theoretical mil and a half to fill the porosity of the metallizing. And then we had to monitor the time between metallizing and sealing and you'll see a slide or a discussion here in a little bit how we handled that problem to move the project along. Uh, coating mixing we checked application defects, dry film, recoat windows. And the F dot spec allows us to do 90% inspections. And the CEI or construction engineering inspector on the job can kind of schedule these with the department. And they come out and take a look around before the clear coat to make sure we have all the deficiencies corrected before we apply clear coat. And in this particular case, we did it by span. Each span had a 90% inspection. Pre-surface cleaning, we removed well spatter, sharp edges and things like that. This is just a picture of the surface preparation before and then after, and that was a pretty good SP5 blast that we could put the metallizing over top of. Uh, anchor profile, we checked with a uh, replica tape, which is one of the most common methods, uh, ASTM D4417 method C, and we actually re required five tests per 100 square feet. So we, because of the mechanical bond of the metallizing, the one thing you really have to know is that you're getting good adhesion to the steel and by making sure you have the right surface profile can eliminate problems. Uh, this is a picture of some of the newer equipment, not, not that we did used all this, but uh, you can see that you have to have a genera generator, a uh, welding machine type, and then uh, the wire feed. And uh, all of these things had to go out. The generator was on the barge. The wire feed thing goes into the containment where you can keep it close to the surface within about 25 feet. And then the welding machine, they actually set up platforms up top to put them up top so they would be close to the wire feed. And all these things, these were the things that the uh, manufacturer came out and made sure worked right to give us a specified product. The metallizing technique, we checked with the applicators as they did it. Uh, you, as you can see by the picture, you have to have the gun extremely close to the surface as compared to like an airless spray gun. And you have to make multiple passes. Uh, this stuff at this electric arc gun comes out in two wires and as the wires cross, it's uh, heated to about 1200 Fahrenheit and the compressed air feeds it to the steel in molten drops. So to get a, get a coating there, you have to do multiple passes with those molten drops being able to hit the steel. And we look for eight to 12 mils. And by doing the multiple passes, you also encourage the adhesion between passes to avoid any type of cohesion, cohesive break in the metallizing. Uh, the adhesion testing, we actually did one test per 100 square feet and it had to be 750 PSI minimum. And with this particular standard, to get one test, you have to average three of these pulls. And what well, you're gonna see a picture in a little bit that these pulls actually uh, cause a repair area if you pull to failure. And we'll show you how we handle that here in a little bit. Construction, during the construction process, we had a lot of uh, requests from the contractor to continue to close lanes and uh, quite frankly, he never got to close anything. He did have some time, some time up uh, top on the shoulder at night that he could go up and pull the tarps over and make sure the containment was working right, but it was done uh, without any lane closures and there was never any interruption to uh, traffic. Uh, all the work, as Chris said, had to be done from the channel. That was one of the challenges of this whole project. And the contract time for this type of project was only 180 days. So we limited our exposure out there so the public wouldn't have any big uh, uh, heartburn with how long we were there. Uh, the 180 days turned into a little bit longer than that with weather days, but it was actually completed within the contract time when you added the weather days to it. We talked a little bit about the metallizing sealer recoat time. One of the concerns is that you, that you get the sealer on the metallizing in time to prevent any oxidation or oxidation of the metallizing. And the contractor actually submitted RFI to allow for 72 hours. Uh, when we thought about it, we actually came up with a plan that uh, the, the FDOT people in District 3 uh, were okay with. And we actually did uh, companion panels at the time. 
And the thing was, if we checked them with a 50 power microscope and we saw any type of oxidation anywhere on any of the companion panels, everything that we had done had to come off and be redone. And it's a contractor's risk. Throughout that project, we probably have upwards to 100 companion panels. We never found anything that had oxidized. So food for thought. The other part of construction after the metallizing, we applied the sealer and we stripe coated, you can see here a little bit. And this is also some of the caulking we put in. Uh, all the joints were caulked like that to try to help prevent any rust bleed or anything like that in the future. We also top coated it and clear coated it. And you can see here, this is a pretty good picture. Uh, that was a nice top coat and the finish was real good. The bridge actually looks nice. The clear coat was applied to all the surfaces again for the longevity that we expect to get out of it and then we're hoping that it'll work well. This is one of the pull test repairs. You can see what we did here was that we actually re-blasted this repair and a little bit of feathering and then they re-metalize it and seal it afterwards. That 72 hour sealing period, it allowed us to do a couple other things. It allowed us to do this right here without any sealer around so we didn't have the problem of any contamination metalizing on top of sealer. And it also allowed us to do a good job of avoiding intercoat uh, contamination. At the end of that 72 hour period, we would seal everything, be able to clean the metalizing real good, seal everything, and we didn't have anything else to contaminate the sealer because these epoxy sealers, penetrating sealers, actually stay tacky for a while. And if you're doing any blasting or any metalizing, while they're tacky in another area of the bridge or another containment and you get any uh, dust or any blowback, it'll contaminate that sealer. Bearings, uh, we stepped on the bearings and we did the tradi our traditional stuff with the F dot spec and this is just the way they turned out. We also clear coated the bearings for the same reason that we wanted to make sure that there would be no, that the bridge would last with the same color on all the pieces. When we got to the construction part of it, we actually did uh, some comparisons. And the bids ranged from 1.82 million to 2.47 million. And that was above the estimate uh, from the engineer of 1.25 million. But when FDOT took a look at all of the uh, mitigating factors, such as the access from below, such as not being able to uh, contain a lane and the abbreviated 180 days, uh, they decided to go on with the project. The uh, pay item uh, cost coating existing structural steel the bid range for that was about $4,000 a ton to about $5,500, $5,600 a ton. If you compare that to the 12 month average for the pay item for polymeric coatings, that was running at the time about uh, $1,025 a ton. That seems a lot more, but if you look at the fact that the metallizing would, should give us 50 plus years of corrosion protection, uh, we were looking at the uh, with maybe an overcoat in between for color and gloss. We were looking at the polymeric coating system and I think Paul's slide earlier said 15 to 30 years, right? And we were looking at 20 to 25, but in the F dot polymeric coating experience, there are some structures, especially in these coastal environments that we're living with a surface life as little as 12 years. So if you take all that in consideration, it was probably well worth the effort. The other thing, if you think about it, that really helped this project was back when we talked about uh, removing the lateral bracing, just taking it out, making it easier to metallize, and then taking apart the intermediate cross frame so we could check the connection plates and remove any of the rust. And if there was a connect connection plate that had uh, a significant section loss, we uh, replaced those. So all of those things seem to be cost up front, but they should help increase the service life of the bridge. Some of the lessons we learned. We learned that uh, it's possible to manage coating projects from the water access to permit flow of traffic to be uninterrupted. And that was the first thing when they hired us as a design team was that we had to deal with not interrupting the traffic. Uh, if you just stop and think about where this key is located, the only way those restaurants, hotels, stores, all of those things get products to the island is this bridge or to the key. It's this bridge. So there was no way we were ever going to close the lane. As a matter of fact, when we did close the lane on the day we got to go out and do the inspection and the assessment, we used the underbridge unit and there were traffic backups for miles upon miles for that four hours we had the unit on that bridge. Uh, so we knew right away there was no way. Uh, we did a nice job of including some design considerations with, with the uh, cross frames and cutting out the angles to, that will help increase the life cycle 
and the construction issues are addressed with the end of the goal in mind and the goal was to get a corrosion protection system that would last in 180 days and that's what we did and there was very there was really no uh, interruption to the public and the business interest we have one complaint one time about noise and that was it so we think we kind of accomplished the goals that we set out to and this is just some pictures real quick uh, you can see this was the bridge with the cables in place and you can see the lift that we had to work off of the barge this is a rigid deck and these are very nice for metallizing projects since you have that equipment up there that's heavy and for men to work off of versus a chain link fence or something like that that's the man lift on the barge this was the containment system when we finally got it placed and you can see that it barely goes over the parapet and uh, then we had the vacuum and dust collecting systems the blast lines and uh, dust collectors uh, blast pots and this was the ground tarps the contractor was required to keep down uh, to uh, make sure that the environmental stuff we didn't contaminate anything on the ground below the bridge did you take the cross frames uh, totally out when you uh, take did you take them down and metalize them on the ground you metal, metalize them up there uh, when, once we got the connection plates done we had already removed the coating from them up there so we took them off laid them down they got the connection plates done put them back up blasted them SC, sp5 metalized okay so you did that you did all that up up there you didn't take them down another you know one of the options you could do is um, if it wasn't so high is you could take those cross frames down and just bring them to a local galvanizer and galvanize them and put them back up that might save you some money could be. Could be. really didn't think of it Kevin that's probably that's probably a good idea wanted to point out too that there is a new specification it's an ashto NSBA specification that will hopefully be adopted in three weeks at SCOBS that will be in conjunction with the, the document that Greg mentioned. It's uh, The new one is called, I think, S8.2, um, Application of Thermal Spray Coatings to Steel Bridges. And so it's the intent is to be adopted by all states. Um, it was had a lot of state input, so hopefully that is adopted by, by every state. And obviously the cost of this is very expensive in the field. So um, that's clearly something to consider. We do anticipate that the cost in the shop will be significantly less. So don't let that scare you away, although I'm not trying to make a commercial for metalizing. Um, it is a good coating, but it, it's definitely costly. There's no doubt about it. However, shop application is cheaper than the field. Yeah, I do think that you have to take into consideration first from a design standpoint if the bridge is even a candidate for metalizing. Uh, there are some structures out there that it would be way too difficult to do the project. Uh, and also, uh, to Jeff's point, uh, shop metalizing will come down. And as we, this becomes more and more competitive, as more contractors get into it, uh, it should, should decrease the price also. You mentioned that, that you took the members out. Um, I forgot why you did that. Um. They, when we looked at them originally, uh, when, for the cross frames connected on the connection plates to each uh, girder, you could see some pack rust, you could see some deterioration. So the department made the decision to take them down, inspect all the, all the connection plates. And if the connection plate needed replacing, to replace it. Otherwise, we blasted it, put metalizing on it, and then we bolted the cross frame back up. Oh, okay. And then, and then you said you used caulking? And where yes. did you use the caulking? Uh, the caulking by the F-dot spec is on all fang surfaces, all splice plates, and any cracks, greater than, cracks or crevices greater than one-half inch that you cannot get paint into. Or let's just say less than one half inch, sorry. Yes.